ever feel like you're driving without a GPS, just kind of reacting to whatever life throws your way? Yeah, just along for the ride. Totally. So today's deep dive is all about taking the wheel and setting a course. Ooh, I like that. And not just in business, but in any part of life where you want to, you know, actually make things happen. Right. Be intentional about it. Exactly. We're calling it strategic planning made digestible. And trust me, it's way more exciting than it sounds. <laughs> We've got this fantastic document, strategic planning process, key frameworks and tools. It's packed with like really actionable advice. And the best part is you don't need an MBA to decode it. That's our job. Exactly. We're here to cut through the jargon and, you know, give you those aha moments that actually change how you approach your goals. So imagine this. Yeah. Instead of just like dreaming about that promotion or that side hustle you've always wanted to start. Right. We've all been there. What if you had a clear roadmap to get there? Okay. Now you're talking. That's the power of strategic planning. It's about asking yourself three really fundamental questions. Where am I now? Honestly, where do I want to be? And how do I bridge that gap? It's like that difference between, you know, just wishing for something and actually mapping out a plan to achieve it. Totally. And that's what makes it so relevant, honestly. Whether you're running a company, a team, or let's be real, just your own life. Okay, so we're not just talking about writing a to-do list, right? Yeah. This is about thinking bigger picture. Right. Absolutely. It's about making choices today that, you know, actually set you up for success tomorrow. And crucially, it's about being adaptable because unlike a static plan, the world throws curveballs, right? Oh, yeah. And strategic thinking helps you adjust your course and sometimes even realize what paths not to take, which is huge. So it's less about like sticking rigidly to a plan, right. but more about having a framework for making smart decisions, even when things get, you know, a little unpredictable. You've got it. It's about being proactive, not reactive. I love that. Now, our trusty document breaks down the strategic planning process into four main phases. Strategic intent, situation analysis, strategy formulation and goal setting, and finally, strategy implementation and operational planning. Okay, that sounds a lot. It's a journey. So let's start with phase one, strategic intent. Now, this sounds a bit like, you know, something you'd hear in a boardroom, but I have a feeling it's relevant to us regular folks too, right? 100%. Think of it as defining your North Star. What guides you? Okay, I like that. It's more than just a mission statement. It's about like really understanding your driving force. We're talking vision, that big, inspiring picture of the future you're aiming for. Then there's your mission, your core purpose, your reason for being. And let's not forget values, those guiding principles that shape your decisions. And honestly, who you are. Exactly. It's like the classic knowing your why, but on a deeper level. Yes. And speaking of big visions, our document mentions companies like Google and Facebook. They're known for setting some seriously ambitious goals. Right, like Google's BHAG, their big, hairy, audacious goal to organize the world's information. Or Facebook, aiming to connect the world. These statements are bold, almost outrageous. Oh, ambitious. Yes, but they fuel these companies' strategies and ultimately, I think, contribute to their incredible success. It's like saying, we're not just aiming for the next hill, we're going for the moon. Exactly, shoot for the stars, right? But, and here's where things get interesting for me. What happens when a company's actions don't match their grand vision or stated values? That's where things get tricky. Think about a time you saw that disconnect. Maybe a company preaching sustainability while, you know, engaging in environmentally harmful practices. Did it impact your trust in them? Absolutely. It feels inauthentic, almost like a betrayal. Exactly. And that's why aligning your strategy with your values is crucial. Whether you're a multinational corporation or an individual building a personal brand, it's about walking the talk, which leads us perfectly to the next phase. Situation analysis. Situation analysis. It sounds a bit like we're about to don our detective hats. Yeah. What exactly are we investigating here? You got it. We're channeling our inner Sherlock to get a clear picture of your current reality, both internally and externally. So it's about looking in the mirror and out the window, yeah. right? Understanding ourselves and the world around us. You nailed it. And to understand the world around us, we start with stakeholders. Stakeholders. Who are they again? Right. So stakeholders are those individuals or groups who are impacted by or have a stake in what you do. Okay. So not just customers, but employees, investors, even the wider community. You got it. It's about understanding everyone who has skin in the game. And recognizing that each stakeholder group has its own set of needs and expectations. Investors are looking for returns. Employees seek job security and growth. Customers want value. Strategic planning involves understanding these sometimes conflicting priorities. That does sound tricky. Like, how do you even begin to make sense of all these moving parts? That's where those frameworks and tools from the document come in handy. They kind of help bring order to the chaos, you know? For internal analysis, there's the VRIO framework. VRIO. Hit me with it. Okay, so imagine you're like a detective, right? Dusting for fingerprints. Yeah. VRIO helps you identify those unique fingerprints of your organization, your resources and capabilities, those things that give you a competitive edge. So we're talking about what makes you stand out from the crowd, right? Right, precisely. VRIO stands for valuable, rare, inimitable, and organized. Let's say you're that local coffee shop again, the one we talked about. Okay. A prime, prime location. That might be a valuable resource, right? A unique brewing method could be rare and inimitable. And a well-trained, passionate staff 
That would be an organized resource. It's like having that secret ingredient that no one else can replicate. You got it. Then we have Porter's value chain. This framework zooms in on every single step involved in, like creating and delivering your product or service, from sourcing raw materials to, get this, after-sales support. So it's not just what you sell, but how you create it, deliver it, and even support it afterward that can give you that competitive edge. Precisely. Think about two companies selling the same product, maybe smartphones. One company might excel at, like, design and innovation, while the other focuses on, say, efficient manufacturing and low costs. It's about understanding your strengths and how each link in your chain contributes to your overall success. Okay, we've looked in the mirror. Now it's time to like gaze out the window at the world outside. And for that, we have Pestle analysis. You're on a roll. Pestle helps us scan the broader environment for those, you know, macro level trends that could impact our strategic choices. So instead of just looking at our immediate competitors, we're considering the bigger forces at play. Exactly. Pestle stands for political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal factors. It's a mouthful. It is. Let's take a real world example. The rise of online shopping. That would fall under the T for technological, right? Absolutely. Online shopping has been a game changer, mm -hmm. forcing traditional retailers to like rethink their entire business model. Exactly. That single pestle factor has completely, and I mean completely, reshaped the retail landscape. And that's why it's so crucial to understand these macro trends. Now, once we've scanned the wider landscape, we zoom in on your specific industry using another handy tool, Porter's Five Forces. I'm ready for it. Give me those five forces. Okay, imagine you're entering a new city. To navigate it successfully, you need to understand its dynamics, right? Absolutely. Porter's Five Forces, they help us analyze the like competitive intensity and attractiveness of an industry. Let's take the streaming service industry as an example. First up, the threat of new entrants. Okay, so with streaming, you'd think the barrier to entry would be pretty high. You need massive content libraries, a user-friendly platform, global yep. reach. You'd think so, but never underestimate the power of innovation. The threat of new players, especially with disruptive technologies or business models, it's always present. Next, we have the bargaining power of buyers. In this case, us, the viewers. And we have a lot of power these days, right? With so many streaming options, we can switch allegiances if a platform's content isn't up to par or if the price is too steep. You're getting it. Now, let's flip the script. The bargaining power of suppliers is also crucial. In the streaming world, your suppliers are the studios, the content creators. So the companies holding the rights to those, like, must-watch shows and movies. Exactly. They hold considerable power, especially as streaming services battle for exclusive rights to popular content. Now imagine if a new technology emerged that allowed us to stream any content for free. That's the threat of substitutes. So it's not just about direct competitors, but anything that could potentially like replace your product or service. Exactly. And finally, the fifth force, and this one's a biggie in the streaming world rivalry among existing competitors. With so many platforms vying for our attention, it's a constant battle for subscribers. Exactly. So by analyzing these five forces, you gain invaluable insights into an industry's dynamics and can make, hopefully, more informed strategic choices. Now, once we've analyzed the industry, it's time to dive deeper into your market and your direct competitors. And for that, I believe we have yet another tool in our arsenal, the BCG Matrix. It sounds a little intimidating, but I'm ready to unlock its secrets. Don't worry, it's not as complex as it sounds. Think of it this way. I'm all ears laid on me. Okay, picture this. You're walking into a bustling marketplace. Right. You see stalls with all these different offerings. Some are attracting huge crowds, others, eh, they're struggling to get noticed. That's what the BCG matrix helps us visualize, but within our own businesses. It's like a sorting hat for your products or services. Okay, I'm intrigued. So how do we decide which stall we're running in this strategic marketplace? Let's start with the superstars, the cash cows. These are your established, reliable offerings. Think about those, like iconic brands that have been market leaders for years. They generate more cash than they consume, providing a steady stream of income. They're like that bakery with a long line. Everyone wants their famous sourdough. Got it. Yeah. Who else is in this marketplace? Next, we've got the rising stars. Literally, we call them stars. They're like that new food truck everyone's raving about. High growth potential, capturing market share quickly. They might require investment to fuel that growth, but their future is bright. High risk, high reward. Okay, so we've got steady income and potential superstars. What else is on display? Now, things get interesting with question marks. Imagine a stall with a unique product, lots of buzz, but, and this is key, it's too early to tell if it will be a hit or a miss. They hold potential, especially in growing markets, but need careful consideration before you go all in. They're like that independent artisan stall. It could be the next big thing or, you know, fade away next season. Tricky. So who's bringing up the rear in our marketplace metaphor? Ah, every market has its dogs. These are products or services in decline low market share in a slow growth market. They might still be generating some revenue, but their long-term prospects are, well, questionable. The stall with the dusty merchandise that everyone walks past? You said it. So with the BCG matrix, we're essentially evaluating our offerings and making strategic decisions about like where to invest, what to maintain, or potentially 
you know, what to phase out. Exactly. It's about resource allocation. You want to milk those cash cows, invest strategically in your stars, carefully consider your question marks, and perhaps, just perhaps, say goodbye to those dogs. And our document also mentioned the McKinsey slash E matrix. Is that similar to our, like, strategic marketplace, but maybe with a more, I don't know, discerning clientele? You could say that. The McKinsey GE matrix takes a more granular look at both the attractiveness of the market and the competitive strength of your business unit. Instead of just growth and share, we're factoring in things like market size, profit potential, regulatory barriers, even, you know, the competitive landscape. So it's like we're not just looking at the popularity of our stall, but the overall potential of the marketplace itself. Exactly. It helps you make strategic decisions, right? Beyond just individual products or services. Should you invest further in this market, hold your position, or maybe even make a strategic exit? It's about aligning your resources with the best opportunities. I'm telling you, these frameworks are giving me so much to think about, not just for, like, businesses, but for personal decisions too. Absolutely. Imagine you're considering a career change. The BCG matrix could help you assess different career paths. Are you drawn to like the stability of a cash cow role in a well-established industry? Or are you more excited by, I don't know, the high growth potential of a star position in say a cutting edge field? It's like choosing your own adventure, but with a strategic compass. So we've analyzed our internal strengths, we've scanned the external environment, we've even evaluated our position in the market. Like, how do we pull it all together to create, you know, a winning strategy? That, my friend, is where strategic synthesis comes in. We take all those puzzle pieces, right? Our internal strengths and weaknesses, the external opportunities and threats, and we try to put them together to form a clear strategic picture. And a classic tool for this is the SWOT analysis. SWOT. I've heard of this one. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. But how do we go from like a simple acronym to actual strategic insights. It's all about making connections. Let's say your strength is your agility and responsiveness to customer needs. That's internal. Then you spot an opportunity, a growing demand for personalized products. That's external. Bang. You've got a potential strategic direction right there. Leverage your agility to capitalize on that personalization trend. I love it. So SWAT helps us connect the dots between who we are and what's happening around us to uncover potential strategic moves. Precisely. It's about being honest about your weaknesses too. Maybe your weakness is, I don't know, limited brand awareness. By acknowledging this, you can start brainstorming strategies to increase visibility, perhaps through social media marketing or strategic partnerships. So it's a blend of self-awareness and environmental awareness, all geared towards making like informed strategic choices. Yeah. What happens once we have that clear picture? That's what we formulate the strategy as. Okay, exactly. Act. We move from analysis to action. And one framework that helps us navigate this phase is Porter's generic strategies. Okay, hit me with those generic strategies. They boil down to three fundamental choices, cost leadership, differentiation, or focus. Let's take, I don't know, a familiar example, the airline industry. You've got airlines like Ryanair or Southwest, known for their low cost, no frills approach. That's cost leadership. Then you have airlines like Emirates or Singapore Airlines, yeah. renowned for their luxurious experience and exceptional service. That's differentiation. Spot on. And then there's focus, where you concentrate on a niche market. Think of boutique airlines specializing in, like luxury travel, or airlines catering to specific regions. So it's about choosing your lane and then owning it, whether it's through price, a unique offering, or, you know, laser focus on a specific market segment. This is making so much sense. And don't forget Ansoff's Matrix, a handy tool for exploring growth opportunities. Do you focus on penetrating your existing market with your current products? Or maybe develop new markets for your existing offerings? Or perhaps innovate with new products for your existing market? Or go all in on diversification? It's like a strategic choose your own adventure. So many possibilities. But even with the most, you know, brilliant plan, things don't always go as expected, do they? That's where risk management and contingency planning come into play, right? Exactly. No plan survives contact with reality perfectly. Remember those curveballs we talked about? That unexpected competitor entering the market, that sudden economic downturn, or even, you know, a global pandemic like we've recently experienced. Talk about a plot twist. So how do we prepare for these strategic curveballs? It's about acknowledging that uncertainty is a part of the game and, you know, building resilience into our plans. We identify potential risks, assess their potential impact, and we develop what we call contingency plans, just in case. So it's like having a plan B and maybe even plan C up your sleeve, just in case things go sideways. Exactly. It's about being agile, adaptable, and ready to pivot when necessary. Because the ability to navigate uncertainty, that's what separates the strategic thinkers from those who just get, you know, swept away by the tide. Now, even with the best laid plans and contingency plans, there's still one crucial element, execution. Right. We can't just talk about it. We have to walk the strategic walk. That's strategy implementation. And our document highlights the McKinsey 7S model as a valuable framework here. What exactly are those 7Ss all about? Think of them as the ingredients for successful execution. You've got strategy, structure, systems, shared values, skills, staff, and style. They're all interconnected, right? Mm -hmm. You might have a brilliant strategy, but if your organizational structure is misaligned or your team lacks the necessary skills, well, implementation can fall flat. It's like having a great recipe, but trying to bake it in a broken oven. Exactly. You need all the elements working in harmony for the magic to happen. Strong leadership that embodies the desired style, 
a culture aligned with your shared values, the right systems and processes in place, it's all part of the execution puzzle. It's like a perfectly choreographed dance where every move contributes to the overall performance. But how do we know if our strategic dance is a hit or a flop? How do we measure success? That's where the balance scorecard comes in. It moves beyond just financial metrics like yeah. profit and revenue, right? To encompass a more holistic view of performance. So it's not just about the bottom line, but also about how we're serving our customers, growing as a team and improving our internal processes. Absolutely. The balance scorecard looks at four key perspectives, financial, customer, internal processes, and learning and growth. It's about finding that sweet spot where financial success goes hand in hand with happy customers, efficient operations, and a culture of continuous improvement. It's like evaluating a restaurant. Mm -hmm. A single Michelin star isn't just about the food, it's about the ambiance, the service, the entire experience. We've covered an incredible amount of ground in this deep dive, from defining our strategic intent and analyzing our situation, to crafting a plan, navigating uncertainty, and ensuring you know, successful execution. We've journeyed from defining your North Star to understanding the dynamics of your strategic marketplace, and even equipped you with frameworks to make informed choices and you know navigate uncertainty. The biggest takeaway for me is that Strategic thinking isn't just for CEOs or business school grads. It's a valuable skill set for anyone who wants to, like, actually make things happen. Absolutely. Whether you're mapping out your career path, launching a new venture, or just trying to navigate life's complexities, understanding these tools and frameworks can empower you to make more informed choices. So to our listeners out there, we challenge you to embrace your inner strategist. Ask yourself those three fundamental questions. Where am I now? Where do I want to be? And how do I get there? Mm. And remember, the journey is just as important as the destination. Stay curious, stay adaptable, and never stop exploring those strategic possibilities. Until next time, happy strategizing.